Let me begin by reading a verse from 2 Samuel 12 and verse 15. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. Now this is the story of uh, King David, Bathsheba and Uriah. And this is after uh, Nathan uh, had uh, departed. Uh, it says that uh, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore. Um, we have to notice two things here. First of all, Bathsheba is called Uriah's wife. This is long after, or long, relatively long after Uriah has uh, died and um, uh, had been killed, basically um, by cause of uh, King David, and after uh, David had taken um, Bathsheba as his wife. And here we see that it says Uriah's wife, not David's wife. And this is really to underscore David's sin. That's the first thing we notice in this verse. Secondly, it says, the Lord struck the child. This was clearly an act of the Lord, and it was um, part of the judgment in response to David's sin. So, why do I take this verse? Well, it calls up a whole other question. Why did God wait so long before he responded to the sin? He could have struck down David um, while he was looking at Bathsheba from the roof of his palace when she was uh, bathing. Or maybe later when he, um, when he committed the adultery. Or before that when he had planned to have Uriah killed on the front line. There were many instances that, logically thinking, you would say, why didn't God stop uh, David there? And um, this would have prevented a lot of um, misery and death. But actually, no, the whole uh, thing passed. Uh, Uriah got killed. Um, the period of mourning uh, passed. And then uh, David took Bathsheba as, um, as his wife. She got pregnant, the whole nine months of gestation uh, went by, the child was born, and only then Nathan came to David to tell him that he had sinned. Uh, the Lord had waited that long. But in spite of that, God had condemned the sin right from the beginning. And we can actually read it if we go back one chapter, uh, 2 Samuel, Samuel 11, in verse 27. And there it says, And when the morning was passed, that's the period of mourning uh, of Bathsheba uh, about uh, the death of her husband Uriah. When the morning was passed, David sent and fetched her into his house. And she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So here we see in one sentence basically uh, the whole, the whole uh, evil thing that had happened. And it says right away, it displeased the Lord right from the beginning. Now, it displeased the Lord is a very friendly translation, I would say. The, the original text um, says actually uh, it was evil in the sight of the Lord. It was really a very bad thing. And um, so to say, displeased is maybe a bit too weak. But in spite of that, God forbore uh, to execute the penalty. He ceased to execute the penalty. And the question is, why? Why did God wait so long and allow so many things to happen? Well, the answer is given by uh, David himself. And uh, we can read it in uh, Psalm 51. And I want to read uh, not the whole psalm, um, although it's basically worth it, but uh, I will read the first uh, four verses uh, first and then go to verses 10 through 13. 
So this is David speaking. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. And then in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold with me, with me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Um, before I continue, uh, one side note. Uh, I've spoken about this uh, more in depth in the past, but just want to mention it here that um, David mentions three things. Um, uh, he says, uh, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. There are three things, and um, if I go uh, over them in the other direction or the order, uh, uh, sin is the last he mentions, but sin is actually uh, when we um, uh, go against God's will, um, not willfully, so by error or yeah, because of our nature. And in this kind of um, uh, sin, we usually, uh, or should be so anyway, we regret it immediately. This is not what we wanted. And so that's sin. That's basically the least severe. And the next thing uh, then is iniquity. Now iniquity is willfully. So, so sin in this context is not willfully, but iniquity is willfully. And the purpose why someone uh, commits iniquity is to serve self, to do something that, that, that you want yourself very much. And although it goes against God's will, but you want it for yourself and therefore you do it by choice. So that's iniquity and you can understand it's more severe because you know actually that you're doing something that God doesn't want. Um, and then the next level, uh, if you will, is transgressions. And transgressions are also willfully, purposefully actually. There is a purpose behind it and the purpose is actually to offend, offend God. So it's really a step further. You purposefully do something in rebellion to God. You know God doesn't want it and that's actually why you do it. So uh, you have these three levels of sin, if you will, and, and we find them... Uh, oftentimes in, in the Old Testament with these words. Um, and we usually put them all together as sin, which is in a way correct, but there is, uh, there is some uh, differentiation between them. So that's just a side note. But what do we get from the words that, that David uh, has spent down here in Psalm 51? We get basically two things. Um, one is there is repentance. There is, there is sincere grief over what he has done and he understands it. this was against God and he, uh, he repents from it. So that's one thing, repentance. And the second thing is growth. There is growth in character. The David after this is not the same as the David before. He has grown. And um, actually, Psalm 51, if you read it in its entirety, you will see that this is a very profound text, maybe even the most profound writing ever written with regards to repentance and growth. And in all this, we see that God had a greater purpose. It had a great, he had a greater purpose. However, that does not mean that there were no consequences. There were no, of course there were. Uh, Uriah was dead. The child was sick and, and, and died, actually. Um, there was grief. Um, it had consequences. But also, it would have consequences after that. Nathan, the prophet, had uh, said to David that from that time on, his house would have problems. Even his children and even his children's children. 
And um, that is, of course, what we can read throughout Scripture, and some might argue that it even continues to this day. Um, but certainly that had consequences for following generations even. So you still may wonder why God allowed all this misery. But let me turn it around. Imagine that God would respond and strike everyone right at the first sin, or even at the, the first sign or the plotting of the sin. Imagine that. What would happen then? Well, then we would never have a chance to repent. We would never have a chance to grow in, in character and in faith. And quite frankly, actually, none of us would be around. We would not even be here. And we would certainly never make it to the kingdom of heaven. And we have plenty of examples in scripture of men with whom God showed great forbearance and had long suffering. And these are the two terms that I chose as a title for today, forbearance and long suffering. Um, just to name a few examples, think of Moses. He was a murderer and a refugee, and he disobeyed God by not circumcising his son. Jonah, he ran away from God. Job, who was self-righteous. Jacob, who deceived his brother and his father. Aaron, who allowed the golden calf to be made and to be worshipped. Paul, who executed uh, or so, no, sorry, who persecuted Christians, none of them would have made it to the kingdom of heaven if God would have given them the penalty for their sins right away. But we know from all of them actually that they have grown uh, in their faith, in their character, and they have been used greatly by God. God's forbearance is actually vital is a vital tool in molding his children. And without it, we would not be able to grow and become what he wants us to be. Now, however, many will take it uh, the other way and think that because of the Lord's forbearance, uh, they can continue in their sins and, uh, and get away with it. <laughs> and so, as a result, they heap more judgment on themselves. This is a big danger against which we must guard ourselves. Uh, Solomon warns for this in Ecclesiastes uh, 8, verse uh, 11 through 13. He says there, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked. Neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. In other words, no one gets away with it in the end. The reason for God's forbearance is not to make us turn to more evil, but to make us repent. It's grace. It is grace that we don't really deserve. Or maybe better put, that we really don't deserve. And in the process, it makes us a stronger character of him. Paul writes about this as well in Romans chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? With his forbearance, God leads us to repentance. That's what it's about. And that is quite something if you think of it. God tolerates our sins and even our rebellion against him. 
And that is why this other word, long-suffering, is so appropriate. God suffers in a way to see our sins. It hurts him. It's not a pleasure to forbear. And if you have children that uh, go against you or against what you've said, you, you know how this feels on a small scale. It's not comparable, of course, to, to God, but it's, uh, it's a shadow of it. But for the sinner that uses this period of grace to, to continue in his sin even more, it works out very bad. Paul continues to write about this in Romans 2, verse 5 to 8. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasured up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and, re and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to, te to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortal immortality eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. God wants our obedience. He desires it very much. But he is not demanding immediate perfect obedience. He puts up with our flaws so that we can be molded and grow into the character that he wants us to be. However, again, there is no excuse to continue to fall and fail. There is no automatic endless forgiveness. Just look back at what we just read in Romans 2 verse 7, where it says, uh, do good by patience, patient continuance. There must, we must work on it. God is, God is so good. He's so good. He's so long-suffering. He gives us space to work within the boundaries that he has set up so that we can repent and develop a godly character. But again, we should not relax in that. Tomorrow is not promised. We should really work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Now one could ask, how can God forbear? How can he put up with us? Now, among other places, we find the answer uh, in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 25. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. It says here with so many words that God is able to forbear with us because Jesus died for our sins. If we have faith in his blood and repent, then his blood covers all our sins. And Paul uses here the word propitiation, which uh, we also find in 1 John uh, 2, verse 2. And um, the Greek word from which this is translated is uh, elastirion, which is also used to describe the lid or um, the, the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. Now the lid is a cover and just to illustrate that, and I've done this also several times in the past, I know, but in the Ark of the Covenant, we have this lid and with it, the angels on top that are looking down. And uh, we can read, uh, of course, this in Exodus. And if you imagine that this lid would be glass, just uh, bear with me, then uh, looking down, these angels would see through and they would see what's inside. And so what's inside?
inside they would um, they would see the the law the, the, the tables with the law written on it and so um, seeing the law would remind them of of us breaking the, these laws and um, uh, God has put these angels there um, and so uh, you can say uh, indirectly God is looking down on the law and is continuously reminded of our uh, transgressions since the presence of law of God is uh, there in the Holy of Holies. So if, if uh, that would be so, it's very bad because God is continuously thinking of how we, we sin and transgress uh, against him. Um, but if that glass would be covered so that the angels cannot see through, then also uh, our sins, as it were, are covered. And that's why blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat uh, to cover the sins. So it's just a picture to, to help you um, understand. And so this this lid is the mercy seat is uh, called uh, elastirion in Greek, um, and that is um, in English the word uh, propitiation that Paul uses here and that John also uses in the New Testament. Um, and, and propitiation means actually um, appeasing of wrath, appeasing wrath. So justice has been done. Sin has been paid for by the blood of Christ. And, and that is why God can forbear with us. He does not only say that it's the blood that covers the, the, the lid, the, the mercy seat, but actually that Jesus is the mercy seat, the propitiation. So he covers in, in different ways, you can say. It's a very beautiful picture um, that uh, God shows. And of course, it's also explained in uh, the book of Hebrews. So if we repent and believe, then G Jesus' blood covers our sins. The penalty is paid. A person died for our sins. However, if we don't repent, justice will be served by our own death, from which there is no resurrection. And uh, I work uh, in, in a software, as a software engineer, and so uh, I think um, maybe a bit weird every now and then, but just f as an illustration for those who, who maybe to whom it, it speaks, I put this in, in programming language, uh, because it's very simple at the core uh, and very logic and it's only two uh, possible outcomes eh? um, if you uh, if you get the gospel the good news then um, there is um, one of two responses to it either you believe it you repent and believe and then you're saved or you don't you don't repent and or you don't believe and you're lost that's basically all there's to it. I know it's not as simple as, the, as that, but at the core it is actually. So God can forbear with a sinner that hasn't repented yet because his or her sins have, have been paid for. Jesus already died. His blood was already shed for this purpose. But the point is that this person must get to the point to accept this payment and that doesn't happen instantaneously most of the times unfortunately but that's the reality and so there God gives time in his grace and mercy he forbears he suffers long he's long suffering and so uh, that we have time to come to this point and to um, to repent and be saved and um, as I just showed the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, if you ever thought of how could God, God um, put up with the Israelites in, in the desert, and it's really a picture for, of us in, in this wilderness of the world, how could God keep up with them? They were rebellious, they were um, unbelieving, um, and um, how could God put up with them? 
Well, every time he saw the camp, he was reminded of the cross, as the camp had the shape of the cross, as we explained also in our study about the tabernacle. And with every sacrifice that they brought at the altar of sacrifice in the, in the sanctuary before the, the tabernacle, every time they made a sacrifice, he was reminded of his son. And that sacrifice for all the sins of all people of all times. And every element in the tabernacle reminded him continuously of his son. We, we went through that when we studied the tabernacle. These are, there are great pictures there. That is how God can put up with us because of Jesus, because of the finished work of Jesus. And so it's only by his infinite grace and mercy that we live. But at the same time, we have to realize that our earthly life is not infinite. And after that, there is judgment. And therefore, we must choose now, today rather than tomorrow. Why? Because we don't have the promise of tomorrow. We don't have it. Many uh, hold of this choice, this decision. They think later, I'm not ready for it. Um, I have to work out this or that first. And either you're yourself in this position or you know people that you maybe speak to, share the gospel with that are in this position. Um, but we don't have this promise of tomorrow. So there is really a, a sense of uh, uh, urgency in all of this and, and even more in these last days as we see really the end approaching very fast and another thing that is that to it is that every day that that we wait or that someone waits uh, this person is heaping up more judgment because every day not being saved is a day living in sin uh, it's a very dangerous position so it's good to be aware of this. It's, it's good to know that God is, is, is forbearing and long-suffering. These are, these are really merciful characteristics of our Lord. Um, but at the same time, we should also understand that um, there is a purpose to it. And that purpose has to be fulfilled rather today than tomorrow. Because it, it may be also too late. And then things are, of course, very bad. So um, I just wanted to, to point to these two characteristics and um, we'll continue on them uh, also next time and see how, how it works in our lives, how we also ought to display forbearance and long-suffering to others as, as we are um, in God's, uh, after God's likeness. But that's for next time. Um, yeah, urgency. There is urgency. That's uh, maybe a very uh, important thing to keep in mind um, for yourself or for those that you minister to. So uh, keep this uh, in mind and um, yeah, pray, pray for for um, those that are still holding off this decision. Amen.